So today's theme is on the gospel and homelessness. And um, let's start by establishing what homelessness really is. Right? Let me put the timer on. Okay, so I don't run. Okay. Homelessness is never about the loss of a roof over our heads. Right? Homelessness has everything to do with the loss of relationship and the loss of anyone who cares. Right? So a couple of years ago when my wife and I you know, we were nominated for the Straits Times Singaporean of the Year. We were extremely, extremely reluctant to be featured, really. You feel so paise, you know, for being praised as heroes in the community, when deep down you know right, there's nothing heroic about it. Right? You feel like an imposter. You know, we were wrestling in our minds. Can you, can you forward the, the slides a little bit? Yeah. What's the big deal, really? Right? It's not like we invented the cure for cancer or you know, we have found the solution to end domestic trauma or eradicate homelessness. Right? In fact, what we did was to surface and bring to attention even more problems uh, with the homelessness in the city. Right? What we're doing is simply sharing and making available whatever we have, and which is not a lot, you know, our home. Right? And why are we being held as role models for simply doing what everybody could do? And people were saying, were telling us, wow, you're so radical. We're like, huh? Like, but doesn't every one of us have a moral compass given by the Spirit of God right? that tell us what is right? And if being radical is to respond to doing what is right, then everybody should be radical, right? Shouldn't we? Right. And so after long seasons right, of, of having to keep answering questions about, you know, from the public about what we do and, and how we do it, I start to wonder if there was a silent drift as Christians in our human society. Right? So there's a Latin word, imago dei, Right, the image of God or made in the image of God. And if God created men and, hu men and women in his, as his image bearers, then being human through extending humanness is simply displaying God's glory and reflecting his character. Right? And being human and extending human humanness is simply what we are all designed to do. Right? Have we really drifted that far that we're now giving up awards to people for simply doing what we're created and designed to do. It's like you know, in going to a, to a school and giving awards to students for studying. Like, you're a student, you're supposed to study. All right. But have we drifted so far that we need to give special attention to what should be normal? When we read Genesis, the book of beginnings, we see how God, the ultimate creator, designed and created all things. We saw how God fashioned every living thing after its own kind, right? The plants, the animals, the insect, and every living thing was like categorized and patterned after its own kind. Yeah. Then, in the midst of creation, God suddenly took pattern and decided to make men not after their own pattern, but out of God's own pattern. It is like God created everything, it's like, mm, those are good. And then he flexed his own muscles. Mm, this one very good. And what separates men and women from every other living thing? As image bearers of God, we are the only ones who reflect the character and highly personal and relational nature of God. No other created beings, not even man's best friend, right, like a dog or a cat, are designed to express kindness, mercy, compassion, patience, long-suffering, forgiveness, and so on. And these are the stuff that distinguish us as human made in God's image. Right? So by a show of hands, I wonder if anyone will say today, you do not have the gift of kindness and therefore you are excused for being unkind. Or 
God has forgotten to give you the gift of compassion. And therefore, you're excused for being uncaring. Anyone? So why have we as a human society degenerated to such a state that impatience and apathy and coldness is now accepted as a norm? Have we really drifted that far? And many of us can recite from memory, right? 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And some of us have that as a wedding verse, right? And this passage is often taught right, as a good-to-have checklist, that the more we can tick off, right, it seems like the better Christian we are. Were you taught that way? I know I was. Right? But what if Paul did not meant it as a checklist? What if it is a description and prescription for every human being designed in the image of God? See, when we see someone falling on the road and hurting themselves, right, everyone will have the same initial reaction. It's like, you know, we will have this innate, instinctive response. And unless something is really wired wrongly, right, not a single one of us will be unmoved. Right? Take for example, right, whenever there's a traffic jam um, or traffic accident right, in the highway, say CTE or AYE, it's a very bizarre phenomenon right, that the long traffic jam it's also happening on the other side where there's no accident. <laughs> you realize that? Right? Everybody slow down to look. Whether it's capo or whether it's genuine interest, it doesn't matter. There's still the instinctively like, what happened? Right? But what we do after looking is what separates each one of us. Do we allow ourselves to follow through with our instinctive response that God has put within us? Or do we allow gym mental gymnastics in our minds to justify why we should not care? Right? Unless we are neurologically or pathologically challenged and in rare you know, exceptions, and I want to un um, uh, understand that there are, there are people who, who are challenged in this way. Right? And, and not to uh, ignore them. But, uh, but everyone else right, is intrinsically designed to extend humaneness to another. The only thing that stops us are the butts in our head. Right? Sorry, I'll just... Right? Butts in our head, right? That doesn't sound very right. But here are some examples. One, that's a good thing to do but I got family that I need to take care. Two, yeah, we need to share, but I need to save enough money first. Three, wait till I retire, law, then I have more time to do good works. But now, cannot lah. Four, I will sure help if genuine one, but who knows if it's really need help or scam. Five, Scarly, kena, you know, other people anyhow post on Facebook. And video go viral. Jialat. Better don't be busybody. Don't be hero. Hero die young. Right? I'm sure you can think of many more such butts in our head. And I'm reminded of a very familiar passage in Luke 10 that seems to illustrate the syndrome. Right? I'm assuming that most of us know this parable very well. Right. And whether or not you are familiar with it, I encourage you to spend some time to mull over it, the full context, right? because it deals with the reality of what it means to inherit eternal life. Right. So let's take a snapshot. Um, a man was going down from Jerusalem, to, uh, from, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, 
as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Let's pause here. Like Jesus introduced the religious priests and Levites as the first character to enter this crime scene. They were on their way from Jerusalem to Jericho, perhaps after performing their religious duties and on their way home. And the Bible only describes what they did, but did not specify their thoughts. What if this story was in a children's book? And you get to fill in the thought bubbles right, of these two characters. What would you put in those thought bubbles? Let's have a few seconds to think about it. What would they be thinking as they sidestep the devastated stranger? I'm so tired, man. I've spent the last seven days on full-time and overtime duties serving God in the temple. I've got no energy for this, man. Surely God understands. Well, wow, this guy looks so chewy. I'm probably going to die from all his wounds. Right? I cannot afford right, to contaminate myself and compromise my priestly purity. I must be responsible and have the right priorities. Let someone else handle this mess. And all are valid reasons. Now let us come to the Samaritan and fill in his thought bubble. What could be in his mind as he tended to the fallen stranger? What do you think? Let's go one more. What would be in your mind if you come across this fallen stranger? What would be in your thought bubble? So let us return to our earlier passage at 1 Corinthians 13 about love. Okay. What if the real reason that we try to read it as an optional list is maybe because there is in a, a deep part of us that is simply unwilling to love? Now I want to make the distinction between willingness and ability. Right? We cannot hold someone to do what they have no ability to do. You know, God will not do that. But whether we have the ability or not, right, we must not be unwilling to do what is right. Yes, there'll be many occasions where we're simply not able to, and that's definitely okay. Right? It's not that we always have to. There are times that we cannot, and it's fine. But we must never say we cannot when the real reason is we will not. Again, I can think of an example from scripture about a man who knew he had no faith and is unable to believe due to the harsh reality facing him. And we read about his response to his own inability. He knows he cannot, but he is willing. In Mark 9, there was a father, right? there's a man, and he is a father to a son who's tormented by a mute spirit. And this spirit would torment his son so severely and, and hurting him and, and cutting him, to, throwing him to the fire, throwing him to the rocks. And, and then when he came to Jesus, right, Jesus said this to him. If you can believe, all things are possible to those who believe. To, to most of us, it's like, well, okay, that's a, that's a good, good word. But can you imagine if you have this father? That, that statement would sound so cruel. What do you mean if I can believe? This is my son, right? That, that, that suffers, I see him suffering every day. I see him tormented every day. I see him being hurt and all I could do is just hold him and hug him and say, please, 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 don't get hurt anymore. Don't get hurt anymore. Don't get hurt. And you still see him being ravished. And because of the mute spirit, the son can't even tell him what's going on. Can you imagine what this father is feeling? And he brought him to the disciples. He's probably sitting at the 5,000, listening to the testimonies of how Jesus sent them up two by two, and how Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And they're testifying that how they were healing the sick, casting out demons. And when he brought them to the disciples, they couldn't do anything. And this is the father hearing this. 
if you can believe. How to believe? Every day is so hard. How to believe? But in 9.23, it says, Immediately, the father of the child cried out after hearing Jesus say that and said with tears in his mind, he says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Like, God, I want to believe. I cannot help me. I want to. You know, the desperation. And a great deliverance happened that day. Not so much of what happened to the son, even though that's a, a, a great miracle. But the greater miracle well, was, was what happened to the father that day. And how when he cried out, God, help my unbelief. God responded to that. We are both makers and takers, right? Sometimes we tell ourselves that we can only take because we cannot make. But we can make. And often, we make excuse. And most of the excuse is justified by our claims of we cannot. But God's response to us is always, if you're willing, I am willing and able. And buying love is never convenient or easy. I could never think of any acts of kindness that doesn't require any form of inconvenience, right? Like, I can't imagine what would happen to me if I told my wife, right? Um, our wedding anniversary is um, three days later, 7 July. Can you imagine? I'll, the morning I'll t I, I, I go up to her, wake her up, and I says, Dear, I want you to know I love you because it's so convenient. And all these years, I don't need to do anything. And I'll be eating frozen food for the rest of my life. <laughs> Every act of love is an act of sacrifice. The word easy and the word love does not go well together. And if it does go well together, it's not a good thing. But if it is worth it, every one of us is capable of great love. That's the only condition. Is it worth it? If it's worth it, I don't care who you are, where you're from, what you did, as long as... <laughs> Well, I'm not supposed to sing, right? <laughs> and this is the question for us to ponder over. Who is worth our time, our patience, our mercy, our compassion? If we deem someone is worth the sacrifice, we will always do it. And here's where we need to stretch our value system. If it is about someone we value highly, no sacrifice is too trivial. When you fall in love, especially the first time, there's nothing you would not do to see her smile, right? When I see your face, okay, I, I, cannot, I cannot sing. Uh, right, you won't sleep, right? Just to talk on the phone till morning or text now, right? And the last hour before sunrise is just repeating this. You hang up first. No, la, you hang up. No, la, you hang up first. No, I'm going to be the last one. And then you wake up at ridiculous hours, right? Before dawn, just to go to McDonald's to buy breakfast and hand them outside the door, just to see her giggle over how, how sweet and how silly you are. Right? Too much disclosure. <laughs> when you're in love, there's nothing that would not be worth it. You get a tattoo and pierce your nose if you have to. Right? You know what that feels like, right? Many of our lives will be transformed if we were to start devoting ourselves to those close to us, our families, friends, colleagues. It may be hard, but wouldn't society look so much better if we all start doing that? So let's conclude that all of us can and should love those who deserve it. So let's make no more excuse. Amen? And we can end here on a few good notes but I would have been unfaithful to what the gospel demands of us. The gospel challenges us to go deeper. Who deserves it? 
who doesn't deserve it? And what about us? Are we worth it? Do we deserve to be loved by the most holy God? For Him to destroy and break the most perfect union of His most beloved Son? Do we deserve the most perfect and obedient Son to give Himself to be torn apart from His Father? To pay the most fatal sentencing just so that ungrateful bastards like us I'm sorry for the word, can be legally adopted into his family. To call us his brothers and for us to call his father, our father, why would God do that? Is there any one of us who can unashamedly say today, God, I'm fully worthy of your love. Love me. Yet he gave and he gave and he gave while we take and we take and we take and 70 times 7 times we take and we take and we go our own way you see there's one thing God cannot do God can never not be good God doesn't try to be good or try to be loving God is good God is love and you know what that is the image we're designed to carry as his image bearers. The glory of God is majestically displayed when we simply be human. No, I'm not talking about being humanistic, right? That is man-centered glory. I'm referring to simply exemplifying what we're innately designed to do, which is to demonstrate a God-shaped humaneness. When anyone displays kindness, unless you have the most hardened of hearts, it always leads to rejoicing and marveling. And this is not exclusively a Christian thing. Every image bearer on earth, when we display sincere and radical humaneness, it always leads to thankfulness over something bigger, much bigger than ourselves. But there's a problem. We've drifted so far away that we now consider apathy and nonchalance and norm. And goodness and kindness is now an exception. And that is the irrevocable result of sin. Sin makes us less human and therefore less humane. Sin gives us strong validations and reasons to say no to what is right and say yes to what is not right. And I believe we can all attest from our past and present even, that the more sinful we are, the less humane we become in how we treat others. Whether it's lust, addiction, greed, covetousness, we satisfy our sinful nature by dehumanizing, objectifying, and exploiting another. And this applies to everyone, regardless of whether we are someone who doesn't know Christ or a Christian of 40 years. When sin is at work, the very thing we know we must do, we end up refusing. And the very thing we know we must not do, we become complicit. Woe is me, then how? Right. And if you're a follower and disciple of Christ, we have something other image bearers do not have. We have freedom from the power and snare of sin. Right? We all know that, right? Most of us know that. Through Christ, we are now no longer slave and subject to sin. Because of Christ, we can now say yes to the very thing we know is right and we no longer have to suffer guilt and condemnation from the accuser from being powerless to do what is right. In Christ, sin is dealt with. Our sinfulness to become less human and therefore less humane is no longer a deterrent. Now it's fully in our grasp to say, Lord, I want to believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I cannot but God, I'm willing. I want to land on a final point, on a more serious note. And most of us have scriptures that troubles us. And mine is this passage in Matthew 7 that often keep, that often keep me awake in the middle of the night. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I was like, dude, these were experienced Christian ministers that Jesus just described as workers of lawlessness. How many of us have prophesied in God's name? How many of us have have cast out demons in Jesus' name? How many of us have done many great works, mighty works in the name of Jesus? If they don't qualify, I'm doomed. Sudala, mampos. Then I overlay this with Matthew 25 in the parable of the sheep and goat. Right? And we also know that. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for, me, for you from the foundation of the world. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. All right? And this we know is contrasted with those he says to his left. He says, depart me, depart from me, you cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick in prison and you did not visit me. Then they say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty? And did not minister to you? Notice this word, minister to you. Then he will say to them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do so to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. You know when you read stuff like that, right? You wake up with cold sweat. Well, I know that God is infinitely good. I also know that God is infinitely just. You cower in fear over his judgment. How do you deal with this heavy stuff? If my year-end appraisal or my life-end appraisal report does not even include any performance of miracles in the name of Jesus, what hope in hell do I have when even those miracle workers are condemned for not being good enough? As I wrestle with this anxieties day and night, I start to see something I never quite saw before. You know what? Jesus said nothing about condemning the workers, the working of miracles. So the presence or the absence of miracle performance is not in question. It's not whether you do or you don't. What was in full question, however, is whether or not they have done the non-miracles, the simple mundane, the boring unnoticeables, the dropping of the two copper coins that nobody bothers about. But Jesus looks at. As we talked about earlier, God will not hold us to what we cannot do. Not all of us will ever perform works of miracles in our life. Right? Not all of us will ever cast out a demon or heal the sick, even if we try our best. Right? Some of us right, will try praying for the sick and they die. We try to cast out demons, they become more depressed. Right? Not all of us will be able to do that. But a righteous judge will never hold us to what we have no abilities to do. But he will definitely hold us to what we have every ability to do. Let's look at what Jesus is pointing out that the goats failed to do. Gave no food, gave no drink, gave no welcome, gave no clothes, gave no comfort, gave no acknowledgement. And these are the list of things that every single one of us have every ability to do. The difference being, would we follow through with our innate design to extend humaneness to love our neighbor? Or do we give excuse and justify with our advanced diploma of Christian ministries? There's absolutely no problem with doing the extraordinary works of miracles. But the big problem comes when we do those at the expense of forsaking and ignoring the simple acts of kindness and humaneness. As far as I know, God is always interested in our faithfulness in the little, never the great. God is not a CEO who rewards our high performances. He does not say, well done, good and high KPI servant. 
or top performing round table servant. God's affirmation is always about the faithful servant. When the Son of Man comes again, will he find faithful men? Faithful in what? Faithful in the little. Even if we've somehow progressed to seem like doing anything great, greatness in God's kingdom is always defined by our faithfulness in the least. Perhaps the reality we don't see is this. When we neglect our humaneness as human image bearers, we're denying God His glory and replacing it with a grotesque image of our own. God in all His majesty will never give His glory to another. If we try to replace it with our own, God will oppose us. Not all who calls Jesus Lord, Lord will inherit the kingdom but those who does the will of our Father. And we could discuss and talk for weeks about the will of our Father, and we ought to, but it all will be castles in sand if we don't start doing the more simple things. And what are some prescriptive mandate? Love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. Care for the vulnerable orphans, the disempowered widows, disadvantaged foreigners, clothe the naked, feed the hungry, bring home the homeless. And at this point, it's very tempting, right, for me to compile a list of biblical prescriptive, but I must resist. Because to do so, we'll be uh, again be led by a checklist of whether we're naughty and nice. So instead, right, instead of being led by a checklist, let's focus on the essence rather than the form. If we embrace the essence, we will always find the forms to express it. So let me quote to you the words of a legendary wise sage. Do or do not, there is no try. See, God desires for us to offer what we have, not we do not. So if we've been forgiven by God, you can forgive. You have received mercy from God, you can extend mercy. If you experience kindness and gentleness from God, you can reciprocate kindness and gentleness. If you have been adopted by God, you can adopt others. If God has prepared a home for you, you can prepare a home for others. In 1 John 4, 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. We may never truly love another if we've never known what it means to be loved by God. We may never truly forgive our enemies if we've never known what it means to be forgiven as God's enemy. And perhaps there are some of us today who feel battered with guilt and condemnation over our ability to love or forgive. We keep hearing them, hearing saying, in in our minds, we must love, we must forgive, we must love, but we just cannot. And we try and we fail and we get condemned even more. If that is you, I want to hear this. I want you to hear this. Stop it. Stop trying harder. Stop trying harder to love. Stop trying harder to forgive. Stop hammering yourself. Instead, I want to invite you to have a deeper conversation about the unconditional love and forgiveness that God has already extended through Christ to whosoever will want it. I want you to consider what we talked about earlier, about being honest with ourselves and crying out to God, I want to believe, help my unbelief. We can only love because He first loved. If you're a follower of Christ and the most imminent presence of the Holy Spirit is within you, right? our spirit man will respond to the Spirit to, to adequately to, to every circumstances and he will reveal how much he loves us and how much he loves the person next to you. Right? As a husband, I will, I'll confess that often I find it difficult to love my wife even though I'm commanded to do so. And I try and I try and find I cannot until I start to see how God loves my wife. And I said, wow, that's how you want to love her? Okay, I will love her the way you love her. And that's how, 
you know, I, I, I learn to love her better. Yeah. When we are restored, right, as image bearers, these things will happen. We will care for people, we will care for things, we will care for environment. And I'm not giving any shout outs to environment movements here, right? But here's a blurb for next week's sermon right, on the gospel and creation care. <laughs> Redeemed image bearers will naturally be a force of preservation and protection and not destroyers of whatever is good and beautiful. And finally, I'd like to end with sharing something very personal. I often get asked questions about the challenges of inviting strangers into our homes and sharing the personal space of me and my wife, right? And how do I manage my sanity like with people intruding into our private space? And I try to keep my heart simple. Right? We never really set out trying to fix anyone's problems, really. Because if you think about it, right? If we start doing that, we, we, try, we, we associate people as a problem. And we think that people is a problem and we'll try to fix them we're actually dehumanizing them. It's a person, right? And so, we recognize that there's only one good Samaritan and we're not qualified to audition for the role that only Jesus can fill. So I measure my success not by how much I help someone, okay? If I do that, I'll be either bitterly crushed with letdowns and disappointments, which happens very often, or be swollen with pride and arrogance over individual triumph that has very little to do with me. By Singaporeans, we measure everything, right? So how and what do we measure? We don't measure our performance in outcomes, okay. but we measure our faithfulness as innkeepers in the story of the Good Samaritan. We simply go about our daily business just as all of us have different things to do. But when Jesus brings his entourage of the broken and wounded, wounded with him and comes knocking on our door, will we be faithful to offer the simple things that everyone can and should? Or will we say no to preserve our OCD obsession with tidiness and control? If we say yes, we can fully trust that the Good Samaritan will know how long and how much it costs to pay for the care of his entourage. And even if we kiasu, kiasi, kiasing hu, right, that we might need to absorb additional costs just in case, God promises that he will pay us back and will never shortchange us. With such assurance, can we say no? With such assurance, Will you say yes? Let's pray. Father, I pray that we have been faithful in holding your word to respond to the simple things, to the everyday things, that we'll, we'll be considered faithful when you come again that our life works and everything we, we pursue after is about delighting in you and delighting in the little things that you delight in. Lord, teach us what it, what it means to, to fall in love once again. And for, for us, some of us who may feel a little bit cold or the spark has gone out, with the, from this relationship with you. Father, I pray, Lord, that you will renew and refire that again. So God, I pray for the, for the for preaching of the word today. Lord, that it will, it will go and seep into our hearts, into our bones and marrows, Lord, and it will germinate and will lead us to respond and we cry out to you. Even when we are not able to, God, we want to be willing and if we're not able to do, any, to, do, to do what we ought to, we can support somebody else to do. So Lord, teach us as a community what it means to be image bearers of you. Right? That as we 
exemplify being human once again, that your love and kindness and everything that you attribute and imbued in us as your character will be displayed to the world. And by that, Lord, by the good works that our life represents, God, you, you will get all the glory and all the praise. So for that, Lord, we, we humbly submit ourselves to you in the name of Jesus.